Hey VC, this is Harvey and welcome back to Spinning the Black Circle. Hope everybody's well and doing good things this weekend. So this is episode number two of 16 in my series in which I cogitate, deliberate and generally enthuse about the All Analog Blue Note Vinyl Ratio campaign. So that's what Blue Note regard as their core collection that was released, re-released between December 2020 on vinyl and late last year. And yes, at the end of each episode, I'll talk a bit about the vinyl quality uh, of these ratios and what it adds to the series. But really, this is just an excuse to talk about great music. Um, so I'm going to do these episodes in the chronology of the reissues, not the order in which the original albums were, were released, um, just to preserve some integrity to people who might want to begin investigating um, or buy these LPs in the, in the reissue campaign order. So without further ado, episode number two in that chronology was the reissue of the 1967 LP by McCoy Tainer, the real McCoy Quartet LP on the Blue Note label, released in, let's say, in 1967. So for those who don't know who McCoy Tainer was, he was a Philadelphia, Pennsylvania-born jazz pianist of some renown because he was a member of the great uh, John Coltrane band in the 60s. Uh, and actually, along with Elvin Jones, the drummer on this LP, half of, on this album, the quartet that recorded uh, Love Supreme. With uh, with John Coltrane, so uh, his McCoy Tanner's reputation as a pianist is 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 clearly embedded, and it, it speaks to the symbiotic really uh, um, playing between Tanner and Jones on this LP, which I'll come back to talk about how great the band is on this album. But completing this lineup, uh, this quartet were Joe Henderson on sax, and his playing is incredibly mature and authoritative on this album. I'll come talk about that as well. And then Ron Carter, my favourite jazz bassist of all time, Ron Carter on bass. And we'll talk about Ron's contribution on this, this great LP too. So what's this LP about then? So it opens with a tune named Passion Dance, which was so named by um, McCoy Tainer after it was recorded because it brought to mind for him kind of um, trance-like uh, states when you're dancing. And you definitely get that flavour from Passion Dance. It's got a kind of Afri African uh, rhythmic quality to it. So I can see why he, why he, um, he gave that, uh, that, that name to the, the song. It, it very much is evocative of what it, what it sounds like. Um, after the motif on this song, you get what's typical on this, this LP is the deafness of McCoy Tainer's piano solos. Wonderful, right-handed, lyrical piano solo. Uh, um, in the first half of um, of Passion Dance uh, and the kind of flourishes he adds to it. And then you've got a kind of quite oblique and challenging Joe Henderson solo, but still very melodic. This isn't a free jazz LP by any sense. Uh, and then probably my favourite solo on the opening track on The Real McCoy is the Elvin Jones uh, drum solo uh, on it, um, which is which is, um, which is wonderful. And there's barely anything on the drum kit, he doesn't seem to hit rim shots, everything, uh, not just on the solo but throughout the track. I love the way the track uh, codes with this kind of wild and free soloing from particularly from from uh, from McCoy Tainer and Elvin Jones to finish the track. And then probably the second track, probably the the definitive um track on on the real McCoy, which is uh, which is contemplation, also the longest track at just over nine minutes. But it flies by because it's so good. So conceptually, contemplation is uh, quite literally about uh, somebody contemplating their life. It's quite a spiritual track. Um, and so it's got um, uh, quite a serious uh, feel to it and con contemplative feel to the tune. So again, well named. Ron Carter's bass on this is just pinpoint. He's the glue that holds this, this together for the rest of the musicians on, on contemplation. Uh, so that they can be kind of free in their playing. And then listen for, for McCoy Tainer's solo, which follow, follows Henderson's. It's really a masterclass in building a solo that still uses the uh, the motif of the song, of the tune, so it doesn't fly off into another uh, realm, as many jazz solos does. It still keeps the central motif 
on contemplation is um is central to its um uh, to its melody throughout throughout uh Taina solo and it must use up I haven't counted it but it must use up something like four of the nine minutes that McCoy Taina solo so for me second track is 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 the definitive track on um on uh on the real McCoy, many, many, many still regard. I think Passion Dance is the standard from this, but I would say Contemplation is the true core uh, of this LP. Though, although all five tracks are absolutely tremendous, uh, so that's Contemplation. Then you've got Four by Five, which which kicks off side two. It's probably the most challenging tune on on the real McCoy, uh, and it's probably the most complex track on the record too. But in a good way, and, and Joe Henderson really excels here. If you listen to his first left channel solo, uh, you know, you just realise what a really talented jazz saxophonist he 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 really was. And then um, and then the, the rhythm section of Elvin Jones and Ron Carter too, effervescent throughout, uh, and they hold uh, the whole track together four by five, despite really an intense and insane pace at times. Um, and try just listening to to Ron Carter's bass line alone on four by five. I'm not sure he, he he plays the same scale twice because it just it moves everywhere, but it's still a really melodic flowing uh, bass line throughout that that third track four by five. And then certainly the easiest to listen to track on this LP, the least demanding, but but a, but a wonderful deep track is 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 the four the fourth track stage for peace. So it's a kind of tranquil ballad, a kind of a bit of a release valve after the after the frenetic. Uh, tones of the previous track four by five, and then what what happens is the Tainer and Henderson uh, effectively play the melody together, uh, ju just just off tempo of each other, but definitely playing all of the melody together for the first two minutes, and then Tainer peels off for quite a quite a speedy solo for a ballad. Actually, he plays against the mood on this, but it really works. Uh, but then he goes through a number of really mood swings as he as he increases and decreases the the pace throughout the track, uh, um, so wonderful um, uh, Taina solo throughout this. And what I really love about uh, Search for Peace is the brushwork of Elvin Jones on drums on this, which he utilises very nicely. And then listen at the end, towards the end, for Henderson's quite breathy sax solo before the melody, before the main mo motif returns returns to the track. So that's Search for Peace, Penolda track. And then it finishes with, um, I did say that, McCoy Tainer is born in Philadelphia, so um, so the fi the final track "Blues on the Corner" is about McCoy Tainer's upbringing, and it's supposed to be evocative of of the you know the um, his time growing up in Philadelphia and hanging out on corners with with boys. So you've got this kind of playful bluesy feel to to "Blues on the Corner." It's probably the most lightweight track on the LP, but it's a great way to finish it. You know, it's a kind of the serious stuff's done and then it kind of brings it down a peg with a fun uh bluesy number and definitely the the rhythm section on blues on the corner is having fun on that final track uh between uh ron carter and elvin jones um so this is for very good reason when now is a, a funky blue note classic and i would i would i would i would use the word funky deliberately and directly too uh you've got an album with a crack band with five wonderful compositions accustomed to playing together and that comes through in spades so high on your list of, of well any jazz release you buy really I mean, it's a wonderful way to start this this one two punch of this blue note reissue series was lee morgan's sign which i which i talked about in the first episode followed by the real mccoy because this is right up there in a as a true jazz great with a crack band throughout and in terms of the vinyl the Kevin Gray mastering is is wonderful on this it's a very analog recording as it should be the sound stage is is massive and Joe Henderson sax in particular benefits um benefits from from that very analog sound as compared to I mean I had this on CD for for 10 years before I even heard it on vinyl uh, and I love the way uh on Joe Henderson's sax, you can hear him kind of peeling away from the mic and back onto it. That really comes through so you, on vinyl, so it feels like you've got a living, breathing band in the room. So you've just got a turntable and you're just investing in jazz, and this should be high on your list because it's a it's a fantastic ratio for the price of a just any normal price of a single brand new LP.
Um, so what you have left here is a is an essential record released in you know in a in a in a great format um, with really careful mastering, just waiting to be bought and listened to. So, so there you have it. Episode number two in the Blue Note Classic series is the nineteen sixty seven release by McCoy Taylor, the real McCoy. Highly recommended. Uh, I'll try and come back quite soon for episode number three because I kept I kept like uh, quite a big uh, gap just because of working other things between episodes one and two. So we'll try and speed these up a bit. Uh, but until then, love to hear what you think of this. Have you heard this LP? You know what do you think about about um, this in terms of its place in the Blue Note canon? What do you think of the vinyl reissue? Please like, subscribe, and I will see you very soon. Bye.